national synergies, uh, our regional synergies webinar uh, is we have Gary Moresti, uh, CEO of Peter Valentine Group of Companies, and Ashley Charles, the CEO of the Prince Albert Regional Economic Development Alliance. So to give a little bit of background for, um, for everyone, Gary, uh, CEO of the Peter Valentine Group of Companies, he brings a diverse leadership experience gained from senior roles leading Northern Enterprises, serving two terms as the Grand Chief of the Prince Albert Grand Council and as a member of parliament. He also sat on numerous for-profit and non-profit boards, ranging from multi-billion dollar publicly traded board to community-based board focused on mobilizing Northern and Indigenous talent into our Canadian workforce. Gary is originally from and raised in the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation community of Pelicaneros in Northeastern Saskatchewan. We also have Ashley Charles. Um, Ashley is a well-known advocate for creating economic development opportunities and serves as the Chief Executive Officer for Parita, connecting city, municipality, and First Nations in fulfilling Parita's vision, which is long-term shared economic prosperity across the Prince Albert region. Before joining Parita, she served in various capacities revolving around community economic development in areas of education and training, human resource management, management consulting, and general management, predominantly in the nat natural resource and retail sectors. A key focus of her work has been social responsibility to improve relations and for the benefit of Indigenous communities in Northern Saskatchewan with Cameco, Silver Standards Resources and SAS Power. Ashley earned a business administration diploma through a joint partnership between the U of S and U of R, and then continued education to obtain a master's of business administration through Cape Breton University, specializing in community economic development. Ashley is a proud mother of two. Welcome Ashley and Gary, and I'm so excited you're here to join us today. All right, thank you for that. I am just going to jump into a PowerPoint presentation that I have here just to give some context on Parita. It's pretty quick, um, but it will start the conversation. All right, let's get started. So Parita's vision is for the shared, long-term shared economic prosperity across the Prince Albert region. Our mission is together strengthening the Prince Albert region's competitiveness, productivity, and community investment opportunities. Our values are professional cooperation and collaboration, enterprising leadership, inclusive and sustainable prosperity, as well as responsible and accountable. Our partners are the City of Prince Albert, Royal Municipal Rural Municipality of Prince Albert, the Town of Shelbrook, and the Peter Ballantyne Group of Companies. So how we all started was, you know, the connection, um, so met and built that relationship and for formally committed to the Parita Partnership through an MOU. Um, the vision was shared um, for a relationship and formally committing to that agreement. Um, and then we decided on a CED initiatives and develop work plans, governance, policies, and um, everything just to implement uh, moving forward. Um, and now we're in the phase where we're, we're acting. Um, we're working together to implement those work plans and also strengthening the partnership and building that stronger regional economy. So Parita's four main pillars are business industry business and industry development, uh, business retention and expansion, strategy and performance, and tourism and marketing. And I'll go into a little bit more detail in the following slides with what those pillars mean. So the business retention and expansion, um, that's the development support. So this area focuses on business opportunities aimed at building um, this thing businesses to networks in order to increase productivity and value with products and service provisions. It aims to foster a healthy climate with doing business within the region. So 
business and industry development, you know, that skill support, investment attraction, industry development support. Uh, this service area focuses on attracting investments and improving business and industry access to resources that provide goods and services for key regional sectors. Um, the attention may shift between the workforce development, site identification and selection support, infrastructure alignment, and appropriate land availability, for instance. Tourism and marketing, so regional visitors and event attractions, promotion and relationship building. The service area involves promoting the advantages and amenities of the region to target markets to additional spending into Prince Albert and area. It also includes organizational marketing, brand alignment that supports the quality of place investment and develops within the region uh, while seeking to strengthen regional uh, stakeholder relationships. Our strategy and performance um, develop, uh, pillar is the development and performance monitoring combined with data collection for analysis. This service area supports the coordination of regional efforts towards strategic priorities, and it may involve shared contracting of services to achieve those organizational objectives. Uh, and they seek to link and leverage cooperation. Cooperative partnerships implement a common performance monitoring scorecard for use across regional agencies and organizations or access important policy impacts or changes. So with the pandemic, um, that's when pretty much Parita was created uh, right in the midst of that chaos. And so a lot of the priorities um, were shifted and so we focused heavily on just building a solid administrative foundation at the beginning. And this was one of the priorities was creating a strategic plan for moving forward. Um, and that has just been um, approved at the board level. And this is our strategy map uh, moving forward from 2020 to 2025. Uh, stakeholders, finance, processes and operations, organizational growth, uh, the biggest thing here is to find those uh, regional synergies that help support um, those four pillars that I had just discussed um, through capacity building and planning and project management. Um, so this just gives us a snapshot of, you know, what we plan on doing within the next uh, three years. I do have an extensive work plan, which I cannot share, but it's, it, it, there's a lot to it. <laughs> so why collaborate? Um, a stronger united voice when engaging with other businesses or levels of government, a stronger relationship, uh, more opportunities for business development and jobs, uh, less duplication for services, proposals, and planning, increased ability to access funds as a regional partnership with different levels of government and combined efforts in attracting investors to the region. Also combined efforts to promote tourism in terms of history, sports and culture. So that was a quick um, overview and thanks for your time. We do have a Pareto website. If you do want to go there, we do have some um, statistics, a welcome package, uh, information. Uh, it's still in works of being developed, but it's, it's a good point. There we go. Can everyone hear me now? Okay, there we go. I guess I'll take over from this point on. And, um, you know, it was interesting to, in chatting with Ashley over the last little while and preparing for this and, and having gone through the PowerPoint, you know, we we're both reminiscing about how much water has gone under the bridge to arrive at the point where you have an organization like Parita. And so I thought I'll touch base on some of that water that's gone under the bridge over the last couple of decades to kind of paint a picture as to how we got here. And it's not to suggest that this organization is the end all be all. This is an organization that is in part the result of a lot of uh, experiences, which I'll describe in a bit, that, um, that we believe will result in a lot of positive outcomes for the Prince Albert region. 
surrounding communities and all that. So, but first of all, thank you to for for the invite, Trista, Heather, uh, to this, and nice to meet everyone um, that's on this call. I'll try not to waste too much of your time, but I'll I'll jump into it a bit here. I was talking a bit about the water under the bridge, and I can tell you, you know, a little bit of my history growing up in northeastern Saskatchewan, interacting with Flim Flon Creighton. And I can tell you that those interactions between our communities and non-Indigenous communities had a very, very coloured past. Some extremely positive, some extremely negative. That relationship with PA was the same and some of the other communities as I grew up from the 70s to, you know, and, and, and over time. And, um, and then, you know, being a, a working in addition at the time and, and bringing kids out into the communities and, you know, trying to broaden horizons and build relationships in my time as Grand Chief at the Prince Albert Grand Council focused on, on education for sure as one priority. Business development was a huge priority for us as well at that time. And, and um, working on effectively leveraging the tools we had within our control to make the best of any and all situations that that confronted us. So all that to say a tremendous amount of water under the bridge. So it was an evolution of understanding between, you know, cities, non-Indigenous people, Indigenous people, municipalities, reserves. I, I can't, and I noticed Richard uh, was was on this call earlier on and and he's been there through through some of this as a bit of a warrior um, through these through these types of events, but a tremendous amount of evolution in understanding each other, and a lot of water under the bridge around misunderstanding each other. A lot of water under the bridge of going through different types of communications to be able to maximize how we understand each other. Water under the bridge and evolution on relationships. Some failed, some were great evolution of urban reserve creation, evolution of business activity, various types and, and sorts. We've seen an evolution of professional and social services emerging in urban towns and, and cities. You know, Prince Albert Grand Council has a huge footprint in, in Prince Albert, for example. The evolution of recreational and cultural initiatives and events in, in towns and cities from powwows to hockey tournaments to in Prince Albert, for example, the Fine Arts Festival, which is one of the few in Canada that have run so long and so successfully. But each of these have contributed a lot of failure, <laughs> a lot of misunderstanding, a tremendous amount of tension from time to time, legal challenges. It's exposed systemic issues around racism, around privilege. But one of the key things is that all the people that have been involved over that time as we travel repeatedly with the water under this bridge is that everybody stuck with it for the most part. Everybody learned from each failure, from each opportunity, because success doesn't happen without failure. And I know that's rhetorical or there's another saying for it, it's cliche, but it is so true because we've had so many failures we've had tremendous opportunities to grow and learn from those failures. However, as well, during that time, we're, we've all been so proud of the successes. And I don't mean to, in my previous comment, say everything was a failure. I can point to so many examples of success that we've saw. We've seen urban creation. Some of the first urban creation in Canada was in Prince Albert in 1976, you know, um, that took a lot of work. We've had retail gas operations, hospitality ventures, hotels, restaurants. Uh, we saw employment of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. We saw the tax base increase in cities and municipalities. We saw um, various other things emerge, such as the spending power of the extra employment or the additional employment or the establishing, establishment of businesses in there. And through that, we saw that we had way more in common than we had in differences. And in fact, what we learned from the things that we had in common actually began to inform why some of those differences existed. And I think that's a key point because 
through that process, we began to meet with each other, talk about the differences, take more risks in our communication, had really authentic conversations through that time. And you can only imagine a relationship. You know, if you've been in a relationship with your partner for decades, you think about the early days and think about the fights, the battles, you know, and you've stuck with it. You think about the successes, the happiness, and it's like you, you just learn from each other and you develop and mature together such as how I kind of see some of our relationships with urban and city uh, organizations, businesses, people, and, and so on and so forth. So much so that we began to arrive at a place where we could let our guard down. We weren't defensive. We weren't offended if one group says, well, we want to make a profit, while the other side said, well, we want to see employment and training. They're not mutually exclusive. They're compatible, right? But we could have those conversations. We could have conversations that say, yeah, treaty and inherent rights exist. Let's talk about that. What does that mean in practice, right? It also means that we could have conversations that as a Canadian citizen, I have rights within the city of PA or Shellbrook or, or wherever that, you know, we, we like to exercise those rights and participate in, in a safe, civil, productive society. So you begin to take more risks, you begin to collaborate, you really engage. And, and so this has been a lot of the water under the bridge, a tremendous amount of evolution, a tremendous amount of opportunity to learn from failures. A key part was we always tried to learn from them. We also were extremely lucky to have so many successes emerge despite the many challenges. And then it allowed us to arrive at a place that said, hmm, we have so much in common. We have so little in terms of differences in actual reality. And let's take this to another step. And that in part from the 1990s, when I was grand chief uh, up to today, we've seen that evolution and it happened. So a little bit of blood, sweat and tears, a little, a fair bit of water under the bridge, but always with a view to forward uh, opportunity, right? So, so I just wanted to finish off with a few, a few key lessons and I avoided making a, getting prepared a whole bunch because I'm ADHD, I think I'm undiagnosed and one of, and one of my kids is diagnosed, but I think all of them are. And going through this with one of my kids, there's this hyper-focus that emerges when you have some ADHD and, I didn't realize that I had a little bit of that. So I've actually tried to use that to focus for a short spurt of time on a specific topic, kind of reaching back to what I've learned, connecting it to the realities around us and try to come up with some kind of make sense type of message. And so that's kind of what he did with some of these key lessons from this water under the bridge. So just that last few points. Number one, in preparing for a relationship between, you know, Indigenous, non-Indigenous or partnerships such as Parita, communication, communication, communication is key. Like it's, I know it's, again, I at the risk of the cliche again, but it's like in real estate, location, location, like communication, communication, even if it's good, bad or otherwise, but stick with it. Like don't get offended and Every one of us have thick skin in some parts and we have thin skin in some parts of our being. And we have to learn how to, to deal with that. And, and a lot of those differences are just simple expressions of misunderstandings or learnings that haven't happened yet. So communication, communication, take the opportunity to learn as much as we can as well. I always share when I do formal bigger presentations, I talk, talk about this pathologizing practice that, that uh, I actually learned from my wife who was working with groups from New Zealand around education and the um, success that had had New Zealand. They talk about pathologizing practice very eloquently. And it talks about how non-Indigenous Canadians, for example, in this case, have not benefited, have been damaged, I guess, from our education system, not really teaching about indigenous history, not teaching and learning about contribution of indigenous people to nation building from, you know, whether it's 
some of the atrocities we face and we've all heard and you know I've got parents and brothers and sisters who went to residential school to the 60s scoop all that but also to how we contributed to economic nation building how we contributed to the world war efforts right so most Canadians have not had the benefit of that in their childhood and we're hoping to see a change in that but that has resulted in most Canadians really having only a skim of understanding about Indigenous Canada. So if you're a CEO uh, wanting to learn, you may have driven through a reserve, you may have seen some houses that look rough, some kids that obviously should be in school during the day, you see some poverty, you see this kind of stuff. And unfortunately, we, that's just some of our reality. We have also tremendous successes, but when only skim, you tend to see the stuff that that is not presented at the best. But you know that you have to work with that community. So you go to your office realizing you have to engage with that community. Then you read reports and it seems to justify what you just saw. High rates of this, lowest rates of that, can't do this or this, that or the other thing. And it's like, oh, okay. And unconsciously you begin to internalize what you think you actually saw justified by the reports you read on the challenges within Indigenous Canada. And you quickly begin to confuse the culture of poverty with the culture of our people. And the culture of poverty does not discriminate. Wherever poverty happens, a lot of the same things that we tend to see happen in the same places without discrimination. Poverty is its own challenge, right? So people through that process begin to confuse the culture of poverty with the culture of the people. So they read these reports, then they go to the next stage of the cycle. And they begin to think, hmm, I predict that based on what I saw, what I read, that community can only maybe do some basic labor type of jobs, some basic labor training, handle a shovel, maybe drive a forklift, maybe do this, that, and the other thing. And of course, I'm overgeneralizing in here to send a message of it, but you know, this happens and I've experienced it. So you begin to prescribe low level deficit theorizing things about indigenous communities, people and businesses. So then you move on, then you actually prescribe them. I think, sorry, you predict them and then you prescribe them. So it informs the actual relationship you're gonna have. Well, they can only do this little bit. So, you know, we'll make some positions available to push a broom and, and that kind of thing. And, and you end up with this constant cycle. So it's critical to be aware that this pathologizing cycle, we sometimes we do it to ourselves as Indigenous people as well. But it's a cycle that exists. And the one way to break from it is my earlier comment is communication, communication, relationship building. Nowhere in that cycle has anybody taken the time to get to really know the dreams, the visions, the goals and aspirations of that community, right? So in preparing for the relationship that you're embarking on, take the opportunity to learn as much as you can, whether it's through the TRC report to RCAP report to local community resources, you know, that provide Indigenous awareness and understanding, um, really take that opportunity and that time to do that. That's one of the key lessons. Second one is from an engagement perspective. Now you're looking to engage in some community people here at different stages. When you actually get to engage, one of the first things I've always asked organizations when I've been called in is, why are you doing it? Do you have your why right? If you do not have your why right, you're going to have more failure than success. If your why, like I'll pretend to be a mining resource company. If your why to engage is because you need a check mark to get a regulatory approval, or you're required to hire some Indigenous people, hopefully not under that pathologizing cycle, um, then you're doing it because you're compelled by either a regulatory requirement or an ethical requirement or something, but you're not going any deeper than feeling compelled. And that comes across as very disingenuous, very quickly seen by everybody, right? So don't do things if, because you're compelled. The second why that I've seen happen is a lot of organizations think it's the right thing to do. But usually an organization, 
maybe be at the CEO at the board level, they're all in. They know it's the right thing. They want to do the right thing and engage. But one of the things, the problem with, with just that approach is a lot of organizations don't do change management or train the whole organization as to why they're engaging. And I'll give you a quick example. When I was at Chemical as an executive, our board and our executive were all in. Like, we're going to do this. Right? Procurement manager go to a community and say, ah, I got to freaking undo this tender to make it available to these freaking communities. It's like, oh my God. Like, so we're mad at him for saying that because he just undid a whole bunch of relationship building. But then we kind of said, why are we mad at him? We should be mad at ourselves. We did not do anything within our own organization to help them understand why we're engaging. So you can understand why simply doing the right thing can actually be worse than if you're doing it uh, because you're compelled. As in compelled, you can plead ignorance a bit. <laughs> if you're doing the right thing, you know that you could do better. And, and when you make mistakes in that space, they just hurt a bit more, right? So the third why, and this is where we recommend, is, is have that joint engagement. Some of that learning that I talked about before, collaborate and arrive at joint goals, establish joint goals together, have a mutually beneficial business relationship with an ROI. That's not just about profit, but it's about a whole bunch of other elements within it as well, right? So make sure you get your why right. And I always ask companies that. I also ask indigenous communities to ask themselves the same question. Why are you engaging with that business or with that organization? Right? If you don't get your why right, you fail to actually plan effectively to maximize the, the opportunity. And uh, so, yeah, and in preparing for that engagement, that's probably the biggest message there is getting your why right and just prepare, prepare, prepare. Third piece, if you're preparing uh, to act and you're actually putting stuff into action and Regardless of whether you did step one or step two, right? But you're in this stage where action is, is on the plate in front of you. Actually take the time to collaborate uh, even more intently if you're in this stage right now. Develop a framework for engagement and be, I think, be catalysts. You know, I, and the, at the risk of another cliche, for me, a catalyst, and I learned this now, I'd be lying if I said that I learned it in high school chemistry because we didn't have high school chemistry in Pelican. We think we all we had was science 10 or 12 or something, but I learned it somewhere. And I may have stolen it from someone, but a catalyst is in a chemistry term, the concept of a catalyst is one where a compound initiates or speeds up a reaction, but that compound is not consumed by those reactions. So in this way, you become a catalyst for action. You don't get caught up in the negative back and forth or in the authentic conversations that can sometimes be challenging to, 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 to respond to. Catalysts are one that bring people together. They can bridge, they can, they can you know, take the high road on, on some of the things that are said in the, pro, in the journey of getting to a better place. Like catalysts are so valuable in that sense. And if each one of us could be catalysts in a big room, hey, even better. But sometimes we need one or two catalysts in the room that can help people move from one stage of the relationship to the other or one part of the action of engagement to another part. So, so being catalysts um, is critical. So it causes you to plan, be informed because you expect those reactions to happen. You don't get consumed by them and distracted. You learn from these reactions together. And at, over that point of time or period of time, you build trust and, and relationships that get you to a, a better place. And then the final key thing for me is that if you're preparing for future engagement, let's say you're into action, now you're you know, you're talking three years down the road, you've done a strategic plan, is track and measure your progress. Like what doesn't get measured? Again, another cliche, jeepers, um, just doesn't get real attention, right? And so measure, keep data, uh, 
strategic planning, when I was coming up, it was like, oh, let's do a five-year strategic plan. Now it's almost they got to do a strategic plan every quarter, every month sometimes. Whether you call it strategic planning, business planning, make sure any plans you have are flexible. If you stay married to a specific point or goal, that, like, look at what happening, what's happening today, geopolitical realities too, like, the various other things that are happening in the world today, like you've got to be responsive. And so strategic planning doesn't mean stubbornly sticking to a five-year plan and, and all that. It's being responsive. So I'm going to shut up at that point because I've probably taken up more time than I can, but just basically those four key lessons from all that water under the bridge for the last 30 years almost that I've been, been in it. So, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, uh, I I love hearing the both of you speak. So uh, it's like a real treat for me. Uh, so right now we're moving on to the uh, panel portion, uh, and so both Heather and I will be asking questions. But are if there are any questions. Uh, for today's guest, please put them in the chat and uh, we will answer them as they come in. Uh, so I will start off with the first question. Um, so the question is, many people uh, listening may be forming or consider forming this new partnership. Uh, so what was the catalyst in starting uh, the relationship with uh, Peter Ballantyne and uh, Prince Albert, the city of Prince Albert and Prida. Ashley, you first. <laughs> All right. It started actually, the dialogue actually started in 2016. Um, I was hired in December of 2019, so I wasn't involved in those first steps, but I definitely have the documents of the um, meetings that were held. Um, there was quite a few with a bunch of parties throughout um, the city of Prince Albert, uh, just coming together and bringing those ideas to the table and then making something out of it. So, you know, that dialogue, um, that contribution was important right from the get-go and the partners, you know, stuck through it and they decided to join forces and strengthen that relationship and collaborate on joint services and economic development um, opportunities. So, um, yeah, previous to uh, Parita, there was some um, um, RITAs within the province that were uh, funded through the government of Saskatchewan. And unfortunately, some a lot didn't survive. Uh, Prince Albert was one of them. But the importance of economic development uh, was still um, still very important. And so those meaningful conversations and dialogue um, on working together continued even after the fact that the RITAs didn't, the PA RITA didn't survive. Um, and then this one was created through grassroots level. So the communities came together, um, understanding, you know, that this is a need. And that's where it, that's where I, came in is to bring this organization to life and to move it forward, so. I'm gonna completely invent an answer here because I've only been with Peter Valentine Group of Companies since August, but as, as you can tell from my presentation, I've been around this issue in the Prince Albert area for a couple of decades at least. And I would like to think that, and I pick on Ashley's comment, uh, grassroots type of, comment is that I think we arrived at a period where we saw the successes happening. We understood that working together can get us further. And sometimes when, and listen, I'm a recovering politician. I'm on step six, I think on this 12 step program of it, but is that governments can, can have best in, intentions to facilitate organizations like this to happen, right? but you can bring a horse to water, but, right? I think what's a little different recently is that it's the grassroots. There was a little more impetus to, 
and there's maybe perhaps a little more swagger, a little more confidence from the communities, Indigenous communities, First Nations communities to say, you know what, let's try to make this happen because we see, we look at the track record of success, you know. I remember conversations in PA when urban reserves was being established and the casino was being talked about. Well, it's going to have prostitution, it's going to be gang activity, it's going to be all this. And it's just like, you just pull your hair out. And we had the same conversations when we were trying to do this in, in Saskatoon. And in Saskatoon, they ended up rejecting it and pushing it out of town and so on and so forth. But, you know, there's there's been that evolution and that water under the bridge of it to try and, and build on these successes. Like the, the casino and urban reserve has been hugely successful. Companies like ours buying into West Wind Aviation to j and &E Welding um, to various other investments have proven to be a huge benefit to everyone, right? And, and I think it's like, okay, how do we take this to the next level? How do we bring government to the table? How do we lobby effectively together to government to respond to us better? How do we lobby and and attract investment together to come into our areas, right? So it's, so we were, I think we were arriving at the right why, because we could see an ROI, so. Thanks for that. Um, okay, I'll ask the next question. So I considered the, to ask um, this question um, because I think that every every community, every group has something going for it. <laughs> Start with that as our base assumption. Um, and I think we all know that we're the best when we lean into our assets, you know, <laughs> as it were, I guess. I mean, I think that works in terms of like community or economic development, that it needs to start from a place of like kind of identifying what you've got going on and how to work from that um, and build into that instead of building from your you know weakest points. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about some of the strategic advantages that allow for this partnership to be successful? So what did you identify um, like from the municipality side, from the First Nation side, from others that were strengths that you could then build on that allowed this partnership to work or to continue working? I guess I'll go first this time, Yash. So, um, one of the things I, I can only speak to my experience when, when, I, when I was at the Grand Council as Grand Chief, we did an internal SWOT analysis, for lack of a better term, that looked at our the different categories that we had. Um, I'm trying to avoid mentioning SWAT, but I have no choice. So what are our strengths? What are some of our weaknesses? What are the opportunities out there? And what are some of the threats to, to it? And very quickly as a grand council, we arrived at that a lot of our strengths are our people, the land access, the, the talent that we saw uh, in front of us every day. And that, um, and that we did have some other strengths that you know I'll skip on at this point, but some of the weaknesses was access to capital. Was we understood that businesses had a hard time talking to us or even wanting to engage us because they're if you phone them a cold call, it was like, well, what do they want? You know, it's that third cousin who wants money type of thing, right? And so it was not it, it, there was there was a weakness or there that where the relationships were not where they should should be and we asked ourselves what is our responsibility in that that part what do we need to do to improve the relationship can't help what they think but what can we do right and we saw that as an opportunity then to to actually do a lot of networking a lot of outreach and and so on and so forth and some of the threats that were clear there that if we didn't act we'd be left further behind and so I'm over generalizing, but we really did a deep dive internally from our First Nation side, group of First Nation side, to really ask ourselves. And then we said, we've got to put some of our own skin in the game. And one of the first things that the Grand Council did in the late, mid 1990s was each community put in 35,000 or so, I may have that number wrong, of the 12 First Nations, and we bought one hotel. From that one hotel, and, you know, it grew to be an over eighty million dollars in assets and over a hundred million in use uh, in short order, right? And it's like 
now the other side saying, no, I shouldn't say the other side, but you know, non-indigenous businesses, cities, towns, municipalities say, hmm, the, there is an economic um, uh, player here that's making a difference, right? And it started the conversation, but you can only grab control of what you can. Like it's easy to sit back and complain about what the other side's doing or not doing. So we try to be proactive and what's within our control to, to take action. Uh, Ashley, would you <laughs> like to add? Yeah, no problem. Um, we also uh, actually a SWOT analysis for Perito when I had first started, and one of the, the first strength was people, um, and also location of Prince Albert. Um, it's a regional growth it has a huge regional growth center, but it also has huge trading area, and. Um, it's, you know, there's natural resources in the north, um, forestry, mining, and in the south, there's agriculture. So it's quite unique um, in location wise. Um, but we also have a strong presence of um, First Nations and Métis uh, living within a region. Uh, and we also are gaining more strength in providing secondary opportunities um, with institutions building. Um, within the region. So it's exciting times. You know, there's um, our two main focuses actually are forestry and tourism. And so with announcements from the pulp mill opening up and the OSB mill as well, uh, we also have tourism, which is our lakes, parks, and also sports and culture. So there's quite a bit of events that do happen just within the region and to uh, build upon that. Um, weakness has been uh, first impressions and perceptions. Um, so that has been um, effort moving forward, you know, trying to uh, build a brand around, uh, you know, Prince Albert region as a place to live um, and live, live, work and play. So with that, you know, working um, collaboratively on um, projects such as a welcome package for people who are looking to invest or to uh, live in the region. Um, those are collaborative efforts um, from Parita. And, you know, their whole in, the whole intent was to attract, right? So there are some successes that I can think of off the top of my head, but yeah, that SWOT analysis, it, it is important to understand, you know, a snapshot of where you're at in terms of, uh, yeah, the labor force, transportation, um, land use, everything. Um, it, it is our backbone. So we need to understand what we're working with in order to be successful. Do you mind if I had a follow-up question? <laughs> um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, because we have people joining from Western Canada and people who watch after might join from Western Canada. So I want to talk about a little bit about um, the urban reserve. As you mentioned, that was the first in... Was it the first in Canada? Um, so what, what is that? <laughs> explain what it is and explain um, how that has been beneficial and sort of allowed you to, to grow and to, you know, do other things. Yeah, it's been interesting. Um, so I think it was about 76 and Prince Albert had the first urban reserve, I think. Um, and um, because they were, unless they were already pre-established, there wasn't a lot of urban reserve creation. And this happened in about 76 under Chief Phil Morin at the time and, and all that. And there was a lot of, and then I was only 12 years old or so at the time, but um, being a bit of a political nerd and geek, you kind of learn and try to see what challenges that they have then. And then you hear about those. And then you, in, in the TLE era of 1992 and on, when they signed a lot of bands in Saskatchewan signed TLE, urban reserve creation was a huge topic. And there was a lot of concern from non First Nation people in cities and towns that are you gonna ghettoize uh, these, these pieces of land within our pristine cities uh, type of thing, right? And you know I, we had that big discussion in PA and Saskatoon back then about the casinos, for example, and prostitution 
and drugs and organized crime and, and all this, and none of that transpired. And we moved on very quickly for that, from that where these urban reserves have been economic engines uh, for the cities. And very clearly, there's a direct link to, to add it to the tax base adding to the employment of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, adding to spending power, uh, buying homes, you know, spending money in furniture stores and, and so on and so forth, that there was a very clear benefit. And it's different across the called into Winnipeg about six years ago to speak to the Manitoba and Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce of urban reserve creation and Saskatchewan's experience. And, the same questions that we were dealing with in the 1990s with urban reserve creations they were dealing with in 2015 uh, in Winnipeg, right? And, and, I, and I imagine it's different across the country. And so we were sharing our experiences, but a lot of the same questions. So a lot of misunderstanding, and it comes back to that, you know, uh, relationship building and communication and learning and, and stuff like that. I think sometimes from a First Nations perspective, perspective, we're a little humble and conservative with respect to the successes. And we don't actually talk much about, about these types of things. And so, um, because you, you would expect that after 20 years that a lot more people would know about the successes of urban reserves, right? So. Ashley, did you wanna add or just will ask the next question? I can't add too much to that. I haven't been involved in creations of urban reserves yet. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Tristan. Okay, uh, so my next question uh, is, can you tell us about like other stakeholders, um, First Nations municipalities that you have been working with as well? And I'm saying that as I'm drinking from my Muscadet cup and knowing that Muscadet is like, uh, so, um, so I'll pose that to Ashley if, uh, or, and then Gary. So, um, cause I know with your guys' experience, there's a lot of grassroots movement. Yeah, definitely. There's been some um, shifts, some changes, but nonetheless, um, that key component of building that relationship has been um, a lot of work in terms of gaining the trust and respect from those uh, parties. Um, it ultimately boils down to creating value uh, for all parties and having realistic expectations um, as to what we plan on delivering and um, what we plan on supporting moving forward um, and thinking long-term. Um, what do we plan on doing? You know, that's that was the main purpose of the strategic plan was to give us an idea of where we want to be in the next five years. And like Gary alluded to, um, that communication was key. Um, but there are other First Nations um, around the region that have shown interest in Parita. Um, Parita is pretty young, though. You know, we're uh, just two years in. Um, and then with the pandemic, we haven't been able to fulfill a lot of um, in-person events, um, socializing, anything like that. Uh, but nonetheless, they still see the value added to having an organization such as Prita and the impact that it would have um, on relationships moving forward with any initiatives, um, whether it be joint planning, uh, tourism, um, investment attraction, uh, those are just some of the top things that I can think of that we're working on jointly uh, in terms of, you know, how we can all benefit from that. Gary, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I can't add too much more. I think um, I've been involved over the years in business and starting new businesses on behalf of the organizations I work for that are in the hundreds of millions, if not over a billion dollars worth of deals I've been involved in. I think one of the next things from a grassroots perspective is entrepreneurship, like individual entrepreneurship. Um, I think we're lagging behind in that. And I'm very proud to see, and it seems to be, and, you know, yesterday was International Day of Women, of women and the vast majority of businesses I see are actually from women, 
that have emerged across Canada, whether I'm seeing them on Facebook or Instagram, blog, you know, advertising and, and all this. And I think the next big wave is has to be um, entrepreneurism, individual entrepreneurship. I think from a, a group of companies perspective, we're, we're still going to keep growing uh, and that, but I think there's tremendous room and opportunity for individual entrepreneurism in the communities. Like we have, services we require in our communities and very few communities have a tax preparer prepare that's got an office or have a, a small mall to have a restaurant and and you know a, a garage uh, you know these types of things a tow truck like these small medium enterprises are the backbone of our economy and i think that's one of the big next things that needs to happen within indigenous canada is that that piece I wanted to, there's a couple of questions on the board. This one really caught my eye. I think it's from John uh, about UNDRIP and, 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 and that. It's, could, do you mind if I, at the risk of offending the hosts? <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a space that is extremely interesting to me. And I noticed another question earlier, but, um, and a lot of communities, yes, are, and I'll read that question if people didn't see it. The lesson of the Blueberry Nation Court win in BC around prior consultation, First Nation land use and treaty seems to suggest some government corporations won't cooperate unless compelled. Can be used to remind players actually uh, don't have a choice. They have to engage. I'm paraphrasing the last little part. And, and that's, that's my hope as well. And Sometimes politics, it kind of bridges into politics. Like, you know, we're familiar that there's a left and there's a right in politics and maybe there's a center of it, you know, whether you're blue liberal or a red Tory type of thing. I don't think left and right is going to exist as politics going forward. We're in a world where, you know, you go far enough right, you go far enough left, you can have Trumpism on the right and you end up at six o'clock down here as a dictator. You go far enough over here, you've got... Putin and they're meeting at the same place at the bottom and so political spectrum is not left to right it's a circle and that that you know the the space I think as society we want to be is somewhere between nine o'clock and three o'clock and we respond accordingly right and you never want to be at six o'clock if I'm going into a space here that could get me in trouble but my point being around the politics is that these are the question here is heavily politically uh, weighted not from that person asking the question, but how people choose to respond to it, right? Do Indigenous people have the right? Should they have the right to have a say on project? This is a more about a national public interest. It's in the best interest of Canada to develop oil sands and, and mines and, and various things and so on and so forth. And I've been accused of being too far left or too far right. So I'm trying to be between three and nine o'clock and three o'clock the best that I can. Sometimes this side makes sense. Sometimes that side makes sense. What we want, what's in short is common sense. So um, I think this one, untrip and free prior and informed consent is so critical because, you know, in speaking with Wilton Littlechild many times and, and others who have worked on this, I, I was co-chair of the National Energy Board Modernization Act a few years ago. And we tackled this question a bit and I came from the perspective and I, we heard from communities, indigenous communities that this should not be scary. This is not about giving up jurisdiction and, and, and shutting projects down. What we're asking for and speaking generally and collectively here a bit is that UNDRIP and especially free prior and informed consent, the F pick comes from, listen, we'd like to have access to all the information we shouldn't have to pay for it. We should, or if we do, we should be able to be provide resources to access the experts so we can have access to that, that free access or not have to break the bank trying to get the information. So as free as possible, whatever that looks like. That way, if we have this, this, this access, then we're informed in being able to make a decision in the best interests of all of Canada, not just our community, certainly for our community, but for our neighboring area and for the whole country. And so the free and informed is our critical first steps. It's not, it's not scary. Every Canadian uh, wants that, right? Um, sorry, I missed the P in there. So the F pick free, and it's gotta be prior, right? As early as possible so that 
you know, we're not at 11.59.59 being asked our opinion on the stat, on our opinion on this project. So it needs to be free. It needs to be far enough ahead in time so that then we meet the eye so that we are informed and we're all at the same page and we're arriving there at about the same time. Then consent, right? And consent, when I spoke with the people who drafted it, consent doesn't mean we have a veto. Consent means if we have that free and it's prior and it's informed, we're in a better place to be able to make an opinion as to the status or our, our position on this project. And maybe it means adjusting it a bit, but the goal is to try to get our consent. We realize we're not always gonna get our consent, but the, if we go through that process and through that process, CEOs and governments, if they go through that process with us as indigenous people, they grow and a lot of the stuff I said earlier in my presentation about not having to suffer through going through all that water under the bridge over the last 30 years, you, you are able to hear the dreams and goals and visions and aspirations of our communities. You hear what's important to us. We can influence what the project looks like and, and then we can move forward at some point, right? So, so I do hope that it would have, um, it will have a positive effect once people get over the initial scariness of it. And, um, and are able to better move forward. So. I wanted to ask a question now about um, the secrets to success. <laughs> um, because I've heard some things uh, that I wanted to pick out, which is um, communication uh, um, is very important. Um, the, the second thing I also heard is um, from Ashley is grassroots, that this was one of the secrets to success at this moment was that there was grassroots energy around this. Uh, making this happen um, because a previous uh, you know organization didn't stay around and then um, the other thing that I heard Gary from you is um, sort of like expect conflict I, I don't know if that's I, I feel like probably there's some kind of like theory on like couples counseling that could be applied to like partnership as well like I don't know I'm not I'm just sort of theorizing because I'm like I think, you know, when people assume that when they're in a relationship and they'll never fight, they don't, they don't really have a relationship. Conflict is part of every relationship, like long-term ongoing close relationship. So expect conflict. <laughs> is there anything else that you've learned in terms of having this relationship over this long period of time um, that has been kind of your keys to success? So Ashley, do you want to go first? Oh, something that I had mentioned before, um, it was ultimately gaining the trust, um, gaining the trust of the members um, and executing those expectations, um, just that what was delivered on the work plan, um, because you need those, you need to keep track of your wins, you need to keep track of your losses, and you need to learn from those failures. Um, and they're gonna come. And so um, the best thing about my board is it's so diverse. Um, there's so many parties at the table um, that range from business, um, business owners, um, education background, uh, municipality, city, uh, and then there's advisors to the board. So it's been very supportive. You know, I'm one employee, but um, I have another employee that I had just actually recently hired, um, thank goodness, uh, because, you know, the asks and the wants are, it's a quite, quite a long list, but it's a big region, right? And so there's a lot that's happening and there's a lot to look forward to. And so those successes are, I just wanted to say, you know, it, if it wasn't for my board, you know, being as supportive as they are, it does make a world of a difference um, in being able to um, advocate and push forward through all of the chaos that's happening. Um, so yeah, building that relationship, uh, gaining that trust and having that respect reciprocated, um, it does create that value. And so, yeah, that communication, it is important. It's extremely important. And I never realized how important it was. And um, the conflict as well, you know, it's going to happen. And how are we going to react? Um, it can be emotional, but, you know, separating those emotions from a business and keeping your eye on um, the main mission and goals of the organization 
um, there can be a happy medium where we meet, but you know, those are instances that just come up. Um, we're human, uh, we all live together. Uh, so um, having those conversations, um, they are meaningful and they're impactful, right? So, uh, and we, we have allowed for that with Parita to have that space, um, to be able to have that open dialogue within, um, throughout the group. So yeah, our key to success is just having that support. Yeah, just jumping in on that and building on it is, yeah, conflict is always inevitable. It's how you deal with it that's 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 the, and I and I don't propose to have an answer for it other than when when a conflict emerges, especially if it's a pretty intense one, I I kind of liken it to to I'm gonna come to an author right away that I've uh, learned a lot from, but if you're playing a and so it's not, I'm not talking about having a fight in hockey type of thing, but you go to the edge and I'm not suggesting living on the edge either because that can be dangerous, but you're times to the edge on a lot of things. And it's in those times where you have the greatest opportunity to grow. So if you're having a breakaway and somebody's her feet are in the air, but you still have control of the puck a bit, like, and it's like, you've never taken a shot, like with your, butt in the air and your skates flying wildly but you you've got a little bit of control and you take a shot and, and you still get the puck in or you're a race car driver and you're driving at a speed to you know because the technology's improved a bit and so on like if we don't push the boundaries sometimes the growth doesn't happen right or if mistakes are not made growth doesn't happen and i talked a bit about that um i always think about those opportunities um, there were best summarized by Viktor Frankl now when he wrote the book The Meaning I think it's called what is it now The Meaning of the Man's Search for Meaning and he talks about and, and my grandpa used to say this too and this is why it always stuck with me but he talked about when there's uh, a stimulus some kind of so a conflict so something has stimulated or caused a conflict potentially to happen and then between that stimulus there's a response right and it's usually like bang like that stimulus response and it's like instant right victor frankel talks about there's always a space between the stimulus and the response and within that space is tremendous power to be harnessed if you actually don't take the opportunity to harness that power you're just doing this constant and, and not learning and growing and he was talking about it from I, from the perspective of of forgiveness for what he went through as you know through the concentration camps but you know he's always taken that space and said you know before i react negatively or in anger or in in anything i'm going to take that brief little moment and think a little deeper for a second before i react wrongly so i can maybe take the opportunity to react properly and that's kind of a bit coming back to that catalyst thing. You don't get consumed by that reaction. You actually take the opportunity in that little space to learn to change the outcome for the better, right? And so, and I've been in a lot of situations in government to government meetings, a business negotiation or uh, a diversity and inclusion where there's a, outright racism to my face and being called whatever um that i try to take the advantage of that of that space and not react you know in a negative way um and i'm not sure it's called taking the high road i don't think it actually is it's much more deeper and bigger than that it's it's actually try to try to cause the positive reaction or a better reaction than otherwise would happen and my grandpa used to say to me in greek we came home from Creighton, Saskatchewan, I living in Pelicaneros and playing in a volleyball tournament. We had our butts handed to us. And there's a few racist comments thrown at us that really got under my skin. So I was living with my grandpa at the time. So I was telling him about it. And he, and he told me exactly almost word for word what Frinker Frankel said. 
But yeah, that book that made it to need it, that when me you was put to that angle, going like, you got to really think about how you react before you actually react, right? Otherwise, you can end up in jail because you're First Nations, and unfortunately, if you react negatively when another person who's not Indigenous beside you, you're more likely to go to jail than they are. <laughs> He was that blunt with it, right? But it's the same message. So, so I think. There's opportunities for being on the edge. There's opportunities to learn from the conflict, but it's taking that space, the power within that space, to react properly. Uh, those are really um, great insights. Really powerful. Um, so I would like to thank you guys so much uh, once again for the presentation and sharing your insights with everyone. Uh, we will uh, break out into our breakout sessions. Uh, so we do have three rooms that, um, and they will be topic based. So if, um, for those who can stick around and who would like to meet each other, Uh, please select a breakout uh, room that you are most um, that piques your interest. And yeah, thank you again for the speaker. So you guys are invited to to chat with everyone. Um, Heather, is there anything else um, before we? No, I wanted to thank you both so much for um, for being on the um, panel, for sharing your insights with us and your thoughts and your lessons. And this absolutely left me with a lot of thought time. It's going to take a, like some processing to just integrate all of this. So um, it was great. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, like Trista said, uh, join a breakout session uh, room if you would like to talk a little bit more and meet some other people working in this area. And um, otherwise, we'll be um, sending out the um, link to the recording after it's ready and um, also just a couple of upcoming webinars that Trista had sort of teased one about what is a co-op and why should I care and also a chance to get in the contest there um, so that'll be coming in the follow-up um, email from this webinar.